welcome back on the show, Yori. And yeah, it's good to have you back. Thank you. Um, Thank you for inviting yeah. me back. <laughs> episode two feels like a very long time ago and just looking back at it like you gave us pretty an interesting insight about your vfx journey as a compositor to becoming an offset supervisor so mm -hmm. yeah just excited to just have you back to see yeah what you've been up to and just where you've been on your travels for work so yeah just yeah tell us a bit about yeah where you've been since we last had you on a podcast and maybe what shows you've been working on well i'm flattered to be be back and uh, congratulations with the success of the podcast yeah it's been a year but it feels like a couple of years you know it's been so busy you know uh, mm. so many things have happened since then um so um yeah i've, I've had mostly been really really busy on set um, of course which has been my speci speciality I've, I've been doing a couple of projects in iceland um but my by far my biggest project project was now this summer in uh, Saudi Arabia where we where I was ended up shooting for two months in the desert in Saudi Arabia which was once in a lifetime for sure really difficult but really amazing as well um, and um, but now I'm going into a really heavy post winter uh, fall and and uh, you know, I'm trying to um, ramp up my my uh, small company and and take on more post work. Uh, but as you guys know, the industry in general is really busy, so finding the right people at the right time is quite tricky. It's always been tricky, but it's certainly not easier at this moment in time. So, uh, in, in terms of the actual projects, I mean. I've been doing a couple of uh, Icelandic um, projects. Uh, I'm now working on an Icelandic movie called uh, Fearless Flyers, which is a uh, director I've been working now. This is my third movie with him. Um, and th so this, these are kind of like um, small indie festival type movies, which I've done a lot of here in Iceland, which has kind of been my uh, bread and butter a lot um, and a way for me to keep connected into the uh, Icelandic community as well, because nowadays mostly my, my main work comes from uh, big international productions, basically. Uh, um, but but this, this kind of work is, I can still kind of use my skills and, and tools and not really give a discount on, on, on the quality as such, but more give a discount on, on, on the actual price in form of guiding them into sensible um, solutions and avoiding the most expensive pitfalls and so on, you know, and just, yeah, trying to help them use their budget in the best possible way. And I love doing that. And just in general, I, I want to try and stay connected to the Icelandic uh, film community, which is, by the way, extremely busy as well with Hollywood and netflix stuff and all of this you know so uh um but yeah and then then of course i i don't remember if i told you last time but um two of my productions from last year actually were very successful uh, this year they came out that one of them the most notable was uh, triangle of sadness a russian capitalist and an American <laughs> communist. On a $250 million luxury yacht. Which I was shooting in uh, Sweden, which is the new uh, Ruben Östlund movie, which ended up winning the uh, Golden, golden uh, the Palm Doors at, at, Cannes, at the Cannes Festival, um, which was amazing, great. You know, I kind of, I really kind of knew it when I was watching uh, the, the, the monitor, you know, you, it was so special and unique and you kind of know oh, this this is gonna have a big impact for sure so uh i wasn't surprised when it won um but then another movie which i did in jordan um last summer also competed in that same uh in ken so so that was quite quite uh, amazing to have two movies which you've been on set supervisor on competing against each other in and what many people consider the most uh, prestigious uh, 
award, you know, and and um, and typical fashion for me, I I, I was invited to both uh, both the parties and couldn't go because I was shooting in in Saudi Arabia, you know. So uh, that's of course, uh, yeah, how it goes. Did you send anyone else? Did you get your wife? To well, do yes, actually, my my Danish colleagues. So I have a kind of a sister company in Copenhagen called Copenhagen Visual, mm-hmm. and they they did go and and did. Uh, have some have, uh, and meet some people and have some fun, you know. So, uh, but next year I will go if I have something competing next year. I will go for sure. I promised the wife, so uh, I, I yeah. do think everyone should watch the first um, first interview. Did but just to give a very quick like two sec thirty second rundown of what mm-hmm. what what we covered. You um, started as a compositor, although actually you'd done some three D before compositing. Yes, working in Iceland, worked at Frame Store London. Mm-hmm. And you began working on set uh, mm-hmm. quite um, after a sort of number of years, mm-hmm. and you have been using helicopters. You filmed the backgrounds for season five of Game of Thrones. Uh, yes, and a, you go into a lot of depth in that in the, in the yeah. episode, so I won't recap it now. No, no. But um, you also talk about um, helicopters versus drones. The fact mm-hmm. that if you go with a drone. It seems easier and cheaper, but then you need transport for yourself and hotels. Exactly. And Iceland is quite big and uh, in certain parts are inaccessible. So if you have a helicopter, yeah. you fly out, you do everything in one go. Yeah. Um, as a composite, I would say, and I think Kofi is a match mover, that helicopter footage is a lot easier to work with than drone footage as well, just because you've got better cameras and it's a little bit more stable. Yeah, exactly. Once you've got a gimbal on there, it's it's the best gimbals in the world you, you're dealing with. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. I would say, by the way, I mean, it's it's basically correct. Mostly in terms of Game of Thrones, uh, the big thing I did for them was that I did a lot of scanning, but I did also shoot plates with them. But but uh, where I was completely on my own and where I kind of was kind of the like my own boss and basically me and me and the the heads of Game of Thrones, Joe Bauer's team kind of developed the the workflow as we went along from season five and onwards. And um, that basically more often than not involved me and maybe the producer, the Icelandic producer, but a lot of the time just me and, and a uh, quite unique pilot there in Iceland called uh, uh, Jón Kjartansson or called Jón Spade, which means uh, John the Blade. Um, <laughs> which is a nickname he has because he flies so close to the mountains that the blades uh, touch the mountains. Uh, so, <laughs> um, so that says so also maybe a little bit of how how he flies. But but uh, this pilot he knows all of the Icelandic uh, highlands like the back of his hand, you know. So uh, that's also been a big part of why. Um, the helicopter was always kind of the best option, Be- apart from the stuff you already mentioned. Um, usually, what we did, you know, when uh, when kind of our workflow had had kind of evolved, it was usually Game of Thrones fa- found maybe four targets on Google Maps and Instagram and whatever, and 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 just compiled a lot of reference in terms of where it's situated and how it's supposed to look. And we got that, and we looked at it, and then that might be four targets usually, and uh, four or five at most. And then we took the helicopter for the whole day, rented it for the whole day, and we usually got those targets in within the first two, three hours, which meant that we had more than half of the time left, which meant that we just went ha- hunting for, for for good stuff, you know. And, and you own that pilot, he always, like, no matter what area you're in uh, in Iceland, you know you can say, "Hey, Jon, I need some really, really nice uh, vertical drops." You know, maybe with a waterfall or something, and it'd be like, "Ah, oh, yeah, there's one over there. So let's go over there." You know, so so it's really, really convenient and a lot of fun to work like that. And um, and yeah, so 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 that was kind of a big kickstart to a lot of my onset stuff as well. Was was um, that plus just the need in general here in Iceland has been growing, not only for the Icelandic production. That's not, not the biggest thing. It's more the, the uh, foreign production that come and shoot in Iceland. You know, it's uh, the need is, is 
growing steadily uh, in terms of onset um, uh, support, you know, because usually they come with their own team, but but the team is now more and more on demand, uh, just as we are all on demand everywhere in VFX these days, it seems like. And, and COVID definitely uh, kind of put a completely new kind of... Um, uh, angle into the whole thing. I mean, at the start of COVID, nobody could go anywhere. So Iceland had a, the best status in the world as the best COVID country. So I could go when my Swedish colleagues or Danish colleagues couldn't go. So they asked me to go, the people that knew me, you know, so I went to do it, their jobs in various places in Europe and, and so on. And then when Iceland opened up for shooting, a lot of the uh, visual effects teams were were kept back, or, or or at the most, really just one guy, like the like one supervisor instead of, you know, normally it might have been five to ten people that came along, you know, and a full team, you know, so uh, for these bigger productions. So then people started using uh, us much more locally, uh, or I mean, they did that before, but then they kind of started relying on us really crucially you know and and it turned out pretty well we didn't we didn't screw it up basically you know and and now it's mm -hmm. it's the the kind of their first choice now really in iceland is to try and get whatever locals they can to to work with them now you know so which is great you know um, the only problem is we we were too few really so uh Iceland is not a big nation. We're only 360,000. And, and uh, that's not all VFX people, I can tell you that. So, um, <clears throat> yeah. So, so we're, we're, str we're struggling with the same kind of uh, uh, man issues that I'm, I'm sure you guys are familiar with in your own work. So, uh, yeah. It, it, it's but a problem. The interesting that... thing that I think is a recurring theme in everyone's career is that you get a lot of opportunities just from circumstances. They can't yeah. find the people or yeah. you've got a lockdown and it's just a matter of when that happens, just doing a good job. Mm -hmm. and exactly. Actually making them not regret it. And Exactly. I mean, that that is like if I if somebody had told me as a young guy, like I, I've said, said this before, like, my best advice to anybody young getting getting into anything really, but especially in our business, I would just say like work hard, be honest, and never give up. If you do those things, it will just accumulate. You know, your hard work will be be noticed, and the honesty will be appreciated. And and um, you'll you know you'll go from one project they noticed all your good qualities. Now you're in, they won't be taking a risk on anybody unknown now, even though they might in theory be be a better compositor on paper or whatever, if they know what they're getting with you and you, and you, in every other facet, you're, you're a nice person, you're an honest person and so on. So we'll, we'll go with what we know, you know, rather than go into the, uh, uh, unsure and this is especially true when it comes to onset and stuff like that because really the the, the most uh, sought after commodity uh, when it comes to shooting or, or onset is is certainty you know so you can even, you could tell them i can sell you something that's going to be 70 percent of our max potential in terms of quality but i can guarantee you can get that they will take the 70%, you know, like nine out of 10 times they'll go for the 17% simply to have that guarantee and to be able to start planning around uh, those 70%, you know, now they can put other different work uh, through, you know, and get that going, you know, so, so when, when you're on set, and this is something that is very difficult to uh, understand often when you're only on the post side, is how many how many corks and wheels need to fit together and, and come together in a perfect timing, you know, for everything to work. So um, in, in that regard, um, it, it, it's um, it sounds weird that they wouldn't go for top draw every time, but 
but certainty is something that that's almost impossible to find on set and uh, so so whatever certainty you can supply which i can't supply certainty but what i do supply the clients especially those who have worked with me before know that i'll come in and i'll just say okay i don't know how but we'll find a way you know i have a certain skill set i've been here before and and um, you know i kind of understand the environment and and there's only so many ways that we really can do this successfully in terms of money logistics safety so on you know so let's just go into the environment and let's see see uh, what we can do you know and this is maybe the the area where i'm starting to if i have to praise myself this is probably one of my bigger strength is to have a very fluid situation and and be able to come up with a plan uh, in the moment you know so um that's certainly something you get that's what you get in extreme environments like in iceland and like for example in the desert where i was in in uh, saudi arabia i really felt how my icelandic background was really helping me up there you know um I didn't Iceland didn't prepare me for the uh, heat but but uh, a lot of other things that did prepare me for so yeah, yeah. yeah. it's uh, fascinating that you yeah. said it I, being from Iceland prepared yeah. for Saudi Arabia <laughs> yeah 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 it sounds <laughs> insane yeah it sounds completely insane but I'll tell you you know yeah. because when you're in the desert it's like these huge wide expansive environments that you're working in you know and some directors in his mind, he goes on a on a recce and say, "Oh yeah, I'll have have the extras out there, and they'll be coming over the rates line, and it's gonna look like Braveheart. It's gonna be amazing." And then you put them in there, and you understand that it's thirty people in a in a ten kilometer scene now, you know, and it's like nothing. It's a drop, you know. And this this is of course something that we understand all the time because we're fixing these kinds of issues in post, you know, but. But this is often something that that goes wrong in, in in shooting, or not goes wrong. Maybe it's not the right word, but it's overestimated, or, or, or people are being a little bit too optimistic in this regard, you know. And and being Icelandic, you, you, we don't have a lot of forests, so we have really big, expansive uh, uh, landscapes as well, you know. And when we're shooting on these uh, big foreign productions, we're we're spending all Day outside in the environment, the sun here is actually quite brutal, as you can see. It's uh, bright, it's it's doing its thing, you know, so that you can easily get sunburned here pretty badly as well. But but it's not warm. At least. That's that's correct. That you've got that right. But uh, but instead, it's windy and it's it's wet. So um, so that so it's a really harsh environment. And in the desert, it's dusty extremely hot and like instead of finding cover for 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 the rain you're finding cover for the sun but and both places are kind of windy the 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 desert's kind of windy actually but not as windy as iceland but but it's you you know the, the of course on the hottest day it was so windy where we were shooting that we couldn't put the tents up to to uh, make shade for ourselves, you know. So we had to, you know, spend the whole day just standing in the sun, you know. And it was forty seven degrees Celsius, and hottest day of my life, guys. So uh, <clears throat> that was a, an experience for sure, you know. And the yeah. same happens in Iceland. You can't put the tents up because it's too windy, and now you spend the whole day standing in the rain instead, you know. In the cold rain, you know, so so these kind of things, and and <clears throat> that's one thing for me personally. But what what it prepared me for is, uh, especially like English and 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 American productions coming into these environments, and it's full of people that are super skilled and like, like have twenty, thirty years experience, and just know their their stuff, and are used to just banging out shots and scenes you know, every day and never letting anything stop them, you know, and then they come into these kinds of environments and the environment just said, no, 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 no. It's not going to happen. You're not going to be doing 20 shots a day. You're going to be doing five shots a day or, or five scenes a day and not maybe shots. That would be awful. But, um, 
so and that that's the same thing we see in Iceland. So I, me and the locals, the, the Saudis, we were kind of we bonded quite a lot because I, like this is exactly what we see in, in in Iceland all the time. And here in Iceland, we try and warn the foreign production and say like, if you're going to try that, it's all going to blow away in the wind or whatever. The same with the locals, mm. but they usually always try it once or twice. And then they don't, then they start listening, you know, they usually, you know, lo- lose one day or, or a tenth or whatever, and then they start listening. And that, so that whole thing was very similar and, and really, uh, yeah, I felt better prepared than, than most Westerners in that production when it came to these things. Yeah. So. Because, because we're not just talking comfort here, are we? We're talking. No, no, no. Logistical issue. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, With your extras talk- can't stand yeah. the side of the hill, and your yeah. equipment can't survive. Exactly, exactly. It's just like you know, for me, I will maybe sooner than than somebody that's used to working in England mainly, or England and Ireland, or something like that, though, and Spain. Uh, you know, I will maybe uh, you know understand as soon as I go into an environment that shooting that red line is not going to be possible because it means that we need to move this gear up there and 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 you know having people you know we would have to place the camera over there and then we need a whole safety procedure for that and so on and of course producers understand that and and you know the the people that take care of these things but it's still like when you <clears throat> it's it's basically you know when you're when you're always in the in the woods looking for the wolf, you know your eye gets trained to seeing the wolf, you know, and that's kind of how you know I see those things pretty quickly, you know. I can and I flag them, and you know sometimes people listen to me, sometimes they don't, but it's also a very good thing for us in VFX understanding that I won't have that green screen, so now I need to. Uh, start talking to the director about keeping a clear mat line or, or, you know, this is going to have to have roto in it, or, or could we maybe change the effect? So we only have overlay instead of something going behind and stuff like that, you know? So, so that re- like interpreting, a, you know, a, a snap moment in an environment to, to what the consequences will mean down the line and post, is something that that um, you know I try to I try to do as best as I can for sure you know because you don't you don't really have in these environments especially you don't have the time to to uh, plan it out you know you really have to work on your experience you don't have the time to measure everything you don't like and and so so you you really have to be comfortable with making those gut calls really and you know when it's comes to god it, it's usually down to experience you know so uh yeah yeah so, so I, I suppose are you able to to tell us what show you yeah, were so on yeah so a- so this mm-hmm. big uh big production we were doing in saudi arabia is a tv show called rise of the witches and um, and just in general saudi arabia is going through so many changes really positive changes and i really i like the the country and the people and the the culture just blew me away. It was amazing being there. The locations, guys, this this is like they are absolutely amazing. Like the like Dune Dune doesn't have anything on us, you know. We we top Dune locations easily, you know. And and uh, let's see with Dune too if they can top us now. But it was really unbelievable in terms of photogenic. Uh, uh, locations, but the production is called, or the the series called the um, Rise of the Witches, and it's kind of a fantasy based thing, um, which is based on uh, uh, some best selling books in the Arab speaking world. Which you could compare them maybe a little bit to, you could compare that a uh, book selling phenomenon maybe a little bit to Harry Potter. But this is much more grown up stuff. This is much more. Um, Hard stuff, and I think in terms of the fantasy, it's probably closer to Witcher or something like that. There's, there is a, maybe a slight Game of Thrones element, but it's much more about magic and and 
and stuff like that. And that those books are then um, they're written by uh, Osama bin, bin Muslim, who is a famous author there, and uh, and they are much more um, based on their actual uh, old uh, folklore, you know, uh, Arabic folklore before pre uh, Islam uh, folklore, basically. So, um, which is a lot about witchcraft and, and, and all kinds of magical uh, stuff going on. So that's basically, you know, there you, you can see how that would, you know, invite a lot of VFX, uh, into the picture, you know, and, and, and that's definitely, you know, so we're dealing with set extensions. We're dealing with doing various magic effects. We're dealing with, Full CT creatures, um, you know, all kinds of uh, CT creatures. Uh, um, if there's any good Houdini artists who are interested in working on this, they can uh, contact me. Uh, we need those uh, for sure. Um, there's a lot of um, there's a lot of uh, matte paintings, of course, and you know. Uh, <clears throat> so it's kind of in terms of uh, what we're doing. It's I wouldn't say the standard suite, but it's 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 the full service basically, you know. So we're doing full uh, story story, uh, full important characters in story, full CT characters that are important in the in the whole story, and um, and then we're basically doing a lot of um, magic effects on, in uh, from these witches and and uh, sorcerers. Um, and they're basically fights and 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 uh, and yeah, doing so. So it's and it's the biggest um, TV series that's been um, produced so far. It's NBC, which is the biggest uh, Arab-speaking uh, producer that's uh, financing and producing this. And um, then we have an Eng- oh, yeah English uh, producer called uh, Dominic Barlow, and he's assembled. A Western, I mean, pri- primarily English um, head of department type crew, you know. So, but but you know, maybe you should say Western. So there was a lot of Western experience in the head. Like most heads of departments were were Westerners, and um, and then you know it was kind of mixed Western and and local in terms of uh, uh, filling the departments. Um, uh, but the, yeah, this uh, this series is uh, yeah by far the biggest production so far, and the anticipation and and the uh, excitement in the Arab Arab uh, world is is very big, you know. So uh, yeah, it's it's uh, I'm I'm excited myself actually to be honest. Yeah. So um yeah, last last time we spoke, you. He had been involved in yeah Doctor Strange in the multiverse, mm-hmm. and I think I think you were you were involved in Apple TV's prehistoric exactly well, yeah if I'm mm-hmm. correct um, yeah are you able to tell us a bit more about your involvement and maybe what stood out yeah I mean not too much more than I told you last time but I mean I now at least there is a name to to that BBC, I think I mentioned it as a BBC production uh, last time. Or, but yeah, I, I was working quite a lot with the BBC on a uh, prehistoric planet. And uh, actually most of the work that we did is yet to come out. So I um, look forward to that. Um, it was amazing working with MPC as well. And, like it was really, I really loved working with them because they, these are like the best nature uh, producers in the world basically and and they are proper proper old school uh, old school uh, roughneck uh, filmmakers you know it's tiny crews it's living quite rough you know and, and uh, it's it's very far from you know your normal big VFX uh, show for sure you know and it's completely once again it's nature you know so it's it's literally I mean, I, I did quite a lot of work in the in the ocean, you know. So uh, it's literally a very fluid situation when you're working, working in that, you know. So um, I hope to do more with them, but it's not. Um, there's, it's not. Nothing is confirmed, but w- I do think we uh, 
we grew to mutually love each other through this production. It's it was a very very uh, yeah great production. Uh, they were here in Iceland for quite 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 a bit, and uh, you can see that in in the series in in. Uh, uh, I think it's the last episode of the second last episode where you where you got the Icelandic plates, um, and then I I work with them in more locations around the the world, um, which was amazing uh, to be honest. Uh, yeah, with with multiverse, I mean it's kind of I like it was kind of similar to what I said last uh, last time and the, I mean the only thing I can add there once again is maybe a title and the fact that I haven't seen it myself <laughs> and it didn't get the greatest reception but um, um, I hope my uh, VFX at least came out uh, alright um, but um, yeah I haven't seen it myself so yeah <laughs> okay um, yeah, Daniel, you were gonna say. Oh, my question is, I'm I'm a compositor myself, so yeah. My question yeah. is, when you're working on set, um, do you find that helps you, especially when you maybe you're in a situation like you say where you have to say no, we can't get this mm-hmm. thing in camera that you're asking for. Compositing, I mean, I definitely think you like. I would I would say the more I work, the and the way I work, I, like. That's another thing. When you're doing a lot of onset work, work, you realize that there's a big difference between almost every supervisor. We all kind of work in our own kind of way. There are best practices. There are we all do our HDRs. We all measure stuff and all of this, you know. But but in terms of how we approach it, and also just in terms of how we engage with the with the rest of the crew, with the with the director, with the producer. Now there's there's complete difference and levels and and all of that so so um which annoys the rest of the crew a lot actually you know because once they get comfortable with one guy another guy comes in and it's different you know and you know once again if you can get some some uh, certainty in film they'll take it all day long you know and so so opening up uncertainty again is never popular but but um i would definitely say for me more and more i would i wouldn't say i say it's probably on par so i would say if you want to be an onset supervisor and be prolific and and successful in that you need to be a very technical photographer for sure even if you have a a, a data wrangler for you to to just develop a, a, a proper vocabulary and a proper kind of logic to th- to thinking. It's basically understanding. The, there's a lot you need to understand, but understanding the camera the best and what you can do and can't do and what's right and what's r- wrong is is like number one in my my view. And lighting is is a part of that but you could then maybe say if you go deep into the camera then you know follow follow that by going deep into light as well but but uh, i would say of course which we all know post is very important having some experience or insight into post is uh, very important there's a lot of brilliant wranglers for example that that never have never done any post you know but are really really good wranglers they're really really good at measuring the stuff and getting the gear and doing everything to a t you know and do, doing your hdrs and stuff like that but because they don't have that post experience they're, they're quite far from being able to make the calls they can make the calls as the last supervisor did it but but making the call and and being happy with it and being able to stand account for it yourself is something they don't they're not able to and they won't won't be be uh, comfortable doing that you know uh, so i think those wranglers who want to go up to supervising they understand that and quickly you know join the post production in some manner you know to start getting their insight into that so i would definitely i mean being being a compositor for me the 
the best supervisors are compositors. That's really for, for me. The best working supervisor in the world for my money, if I have to uh, put money on it, is Paul Lambert from DNEC. And uh, the Dune and the Blade Runner, the new one, and stuff like that. His approach is what I wish I could do every time if I had enough money and power. If I was as if yeah as influential and powerful as him, I, I would I would choose to do it that way. If I had the good foresight of of seeing it ahead of time, like he's been doing, um, and I I definitely feel like in general compositing gives you an edge if that's your strong side as a supervisor because. Film is a photographic uh, medium, and compositing is a ph photographic medium. But whether people, I mean, I know a lot of uh, compositors don't do ph photography and and are probably not even aware that what they're basically doing is really, really fancy expose, exposures and, and stuff like that, which we are now digitized and, and can do anything with it, really. But it's based in, in a photography. The uh, universe, you know, and and understanding that, uh, and having that as a f uh, fundament when you go go then on set is is a very strong uh, way to approach it. I mean, at the same time, you know, if it's CG heavy productions and stuff like that, you have an edge in that when you're coming from 3D. But for me, <clears throat> I, I have I have uh, issues with CG heavy stuff always. You know, I think. C CT should be a, a last resort solution, not because it's terrible or anything. It's actually our most powerful tool. But, you know, we should always try and f photograph something. It's only at the point where we can't photograph it, we need, and then we synth synthesize it from the ground up. And the more we can then base that on real photography, you know, the more we can use photograph textures photogrammetry now actual real scans rather than modeling and for me also i prefer uh, motion capture to animation you know i'm all about realism in general and and and, and you know so all my projects and uh, where i'm involved it's always about getting as much realism as possible so i'm not discounting the the the, the uh, amazing stuff that you do in animation as a, perform a performance, you know, but that when, when I'm working, that's never what I'm going for. I'm always just going for basically a capture. So I can do a capture or I can ask an animator to try and simulate a capture. And of course, always I feel the, the actual capture is going to be better and more realistic than the, uh, than the animation, the, the, you know, where you try to emulate uh, the real um, motion, you know. So, um, <clears throat> so I mean, everything has strengths and 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 weaknesses. But I would definitely say, uh, in my mind, you walk into that set with with the strongest uh, Swiss Army knife as a senior compositor. Uh, you have, need to have all the other stuff, you know. You need to be. You need to be. Uh, another thing is, you need to be good, good, a good people person. You know, you really need to be be kind of um, not brave, but at least on the front foot in engaging with people and, and stuff like that. And many supervisors are not, then and, and they 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 run into more problems than they have to uh, for that. I think. Uh, so, you know, in many productions, I get so much um, credit and, and um, you know, praise for for simply not being awkward to deal with. You know, I don't even have to do a good job. You know, I'm just fairly, fairly normal and can, can uh, get, get a joke and so on. And, and uh, film people are usually very, not not very scientific type guys, you know, and and then you get your really, really clever scientific type 3D visual effects supervisor or something like that. And these two guys, you know, you've got one that's, you know, maybe even, you know, a lot of people in film are actually, um, uh, what do you call it? Um, uh, uh, um, 
have, have dyslexia and, you know, uh, maybe ADHD, you know, whereas, it, you know, for example, with the, those kind of personality traits, they become superpowers in the onset environment, you know, because it's actually that you, what you need. You need to be able to to handle the pressure and, and deal with risk and take. So, so, so it's, it's amazing to see how these people absolutely flourish in, in the, the onset environment, you know, and, but then, you know, your superstar, your office superstar now can really have a hard time, you know, because it's way too hot and he doesn't have the right clothes. And then everybody's shouting and rass and, you know, because there's no time for fine courtesies and stuff like that, you know. So, so people get understandably quite um, uh, kind of uh, jolted and jarred by by the culture on set often, you know. And I, 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 my advice would be just embrace it, you know. Don't don't like, yeah, you might get a little bit bruised ego the first couple of days, but. Don't worry. Just get through that and, and keep going. Like I said, never give up. Just keep going, and it'll be really fun after after a short while, you know. So, yeah. yeah. But no, back to your yeah. question, Daniel. I think if, uh, from your perspective, your company, you. I mean, if you want to end up supervising, you you're definitely on a good good uh, trajectory. Yuri, I had a, a question for you. I was just I was just curious, just as like. Just being the man you are, as with, with so much experience, I'm just wondering what criteria you look for when you're deciding which project to onboard. I mean, it used to be if they want me and and they'll and if they're likely to pay the bill, you know. But uh, and now it's more. I I mean, I have to think beyond myself. But if I was just, you know, when we spoke the first. Or like maybe a year before the first time I was on, so two years ago or something. Then I was much more a one man kind of thing, you know. I did crew up with freelancers for post for the various post uh, production projects, but I could really I was very um, free, you know. I could jump onto any production, and I still can do that for the most part. But um, I do need to think a little bit more about about kind of. Uh, servicing my office and my post production, and now I've got two staffers uh, with me, and so on. You know, so it's tiny still, but it's still it's something that I'm building, and it's something that needs to be cared for. You know, so uh, uh, um, so now that's a little bit of a factor, but in general, my the biggest influence is simply if I want to go on the event adventure to be honest you know if i want to go to that place if i can if i think it's going to be you know really adventurous you know I, I, that that's something i really thrive up is is kind of a, you know almost going into you know i usually call it rambo mode you know it's kind of a you know you go on a mission and and you're you're kind of soldier like in in many ways you know uh, in a light version maybe and also when you come back from these really big projects and and this is not vfx specific but for crew crew in general you kind of get a slight kind of a kind of a super super mild version of a ptsd SD or something because it's very difficult you know going from that almost survival type environment into just normality again, you know, and, and especially if you think about our work, you go from that kind of maybe crazy kind of, uh, you you the last week and you now have to do two weeks of shooting in one week because this and that was behind then. And, and uh, so now you just need to make like 10 new plans every day, you know, and just to try and get it in there and, and then it's all over all of a sudden. And then you go back to something that needs to be really stable and really thought about, you know, office environment and so on. And in terms of my home life, family, you know, kids that need their attention and stable, stable parents and all of that, you know. And so it, it is quite tricky, you know, and then um, me and my wife, we've kind of worked out kind of a week try and take a decompression period you know maybe 
take a trip together or something. Uh, after this one, I spent two days in London, met my best friend there, and uh, you know, went out for dinner, had some drinks, went to the Chelsea Tottenham game the day uh, next day, and you know, just you know, to try and kind of just do something completely other than work and other than your home life, and then come back and and try and be normal. Uh, so yeah. But I would say the adventure is still the biggest factor. And, uh, yeah, mm. that's probably why, why I will be in London starting January next. So that's for the adventure as well. So, yeah. Cool. Uh, we'll, yes. catch up. we'll have to catch up in London. We'll have to do an on-location live yeah. episode. Yes, that yeah. would be cool. And maybe <laughs> maybe uh, on-location uh, pint as well. Who knows, eh? <laughs> yeah. That sounds good. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, yeah. One thing you meant because you started talking early on, and then obviously we went on. And we talked about a lot of different things, but mm -hmm. um, you were talking about Icelandic productions mm -hmm. and talking about guiding them with budget. So mm -hmm. obviously you work with very big budgets and very small budgets. Yeah. And I just like to talk about how you uh, maybe help guide your clients in in this in this way, the filmmakers, with what they have to get the the art they want yeah exactly that i mean that that's the key word you you mentioned the uh, get the art that they want that's exactly the key word uh, in terms of the big budgets usually when i'm working with the very big budgets i am kind of i am working under another show supervisor and they have kind of settled or, or take care of those and i just get my my parameters to work with and i go out and execute that basically uh, uh this last one was a little bit different we kind of shared that that kind of a burden when it came came in to, to shooting um but um uh i would i would definitely um say that the key key word you you, you put in there is that that arc you know it's so what you need to do as a supervisor is you need to be really interested in storytelling and filmmaking and understanding what what the um, what what the director or the the screenwriter is trying to do you know it's in terms of telling the story and um, i remember i can give you an example an icelandic director was like asking me all kinds of really technical uh, questions about um you know, uh, f uh, face swapping and face tracking and stuff like that. And and I knew that you know he th he wouldn't be able he would never have have a budget that would make it viable. This is for for the main character in, in the in the story. Uh, or sorry, it was the children of the main ca character. They had to shoot for some reason uh, sixteen hours a day. And because they had to do day and night and all kinds of stuff. And when you're working with children, small children, that's not a, really an option, you know? So, and he went back and forth and thought about this. And I like, and I basically said, Did, have you think the thing I thought about making a casting call for twins, you know, and trying to cast some twins. And he's like, Oh yeah, of course twins. That, yeah, yeah, that could work, you know? And so that became the way they wanted to approach it. I just, you know, I just uh, uh, stuffed myself for, for a couple of million ISK or something in terms of work, you know, that I'm not getting now. But I don't care about that. And I know working with these producers and just in general that if you approach things like that and you're in general likable, engaged with people, and you and you and uh, and you you approach uh, their script and their project as 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 yours really how can i get it done you know with, with for whatever mean and I, I really never put a thought into what it means econ economically for me to make this call or the other call you know because i will almost always cut out the effects if i can like my my thing is always can we get it in camera is it possible to do something to get it in camera can we get a prosthetic or can we get costume to do like this or whatever and um 
So if that's an option and it's going to look good in camera, then I'll always go for that rather than create work for myself. Um, this is something that's actually a bit of a problem in our industry when it comes to the CG heavy stuff, you know, because you need to build such enormous monsters around CG production that, you know, then you st start to need to have to be able, uh, able to feed those monsters. And uh, I've seen some very dodgy calls being made uh, through the years, you know, uh, for for CG, you know, where I felt like it was simply basically, you know, uh, being done f to get some work in, you know, where it was unnecessary in my view, you know, and bad use of budget. Um, but, yeah, people need to answer for that themselves. You know, the way I, I approach it is exactly this. What's the art? What what would be cool? What what? How the, how's this director? I know this director. He like likes it kind of understated. You know, how about if we do it like this? And I just – and I go in and I'm really, really uh, unapologetic and unshy about talking to them as almost as as if I was writing the script with them or whatever, you know, I'll be just as uh, curious and, and just as uh, probing in terms of what they can do as they will be towards me, you know, and, and so far it's been really well received, you know, I really like I, of, most often the producers and, and directors absolutely love that, you know, they, they really appreciate that the, first of all you're showing them that you're really reading the stuff not just read quickly reading it and finding where where your vfx is going to be but you're really reading it you're understanding the meme, meaning you understand the 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 emotional implications that are happening now in this scene you know so 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 you can even go to completely different visuals at, but because you understand that that's going to translate into the same emotional response, you can then suggest something that's very far from the original idea, you know. And, and this is something I'm like I, I, I do, you know, uh, meddle around with with stories myself and stuff like that, and and I love it, and I love I love I'm always super curious about all the other departments and stuff like that so so this is the filmmaker part and unfortunately many vfx soups are not uh, big on the filmmaker part you know but i would say most vfx people get into vfx because they also love film you know and i would say that it's mm -hmm. really really important that you keep cultivating that don't get too to inside baseball with the VFX only keep go, uh, you know, keep your original love of the whole medium, you know, watch a lot of movies and learn about the other departments and, and yeah, you know, don't never be shy of going outside of your, your VFX box, you know? So, um, yeah. yeah. Do you think that sometimes when you get this discourse about like bad CGI, Sometimes it's not even the technical quality of the the VFX. I mean, sometimes it is. Yeah, like cats. I mean, but sometimes <laughs> be that the the emotional engagement is yeah. not there because yeah. once people are not interested in the story, then you start picking at everything. You exactly. Pick at the costumes. You pick at the you know you pick at the casting. You pick at all the bits. And yeah. the CGI and VFX is an easy target in that sense. Mm -hmm. Because I mean, when the story, when you move, when the uh, when your storytelling is wrong, that mm -hmm. just makes all our work look bad. Exactly. I think. I mean, I, I I don't think this is my pet peeve. This is this is the by far the the uh, biggest reason. Like, I can give you an example. Like, how many uh, driving shots have you seen, even lately, and just in general, you know, where it's clearly a green screen car. And and it's a terrible shot, you know. I've seen so many, you know. And rarely do I have an issue with the actual keying, which people always mention if if the if that's uh, the issue. Yeah, sure, you can find some where, where there's a horrible key, but usually the key is fine. The issue is the staging, the camera position, the camera behavior, and more often than not, it's overexposed in the, in the. Uh, or it's like too well lit in the cabin, you know. You don't like you should have 
complete blackness in the cabin where there's shadow. You shouldn't have, have ambient light go, bouncing around there. Or you should have it uh, completely overexposed o- outside. These kind of, this kind of just basic uh, kind of um, understanding of, of camera camera physics, you know, and, and it's eluded most of the, like uh, too much of VFX for many years, but that's, that's one issue. That's so, so that issue is a t- terrible green screen shot, but it's really nothing to do with the actual pulling the key and trying to integrate it. it the, all of the mistakes were made from how it was shot basically. And of course that falls on the supervisor for sure. Um, but then you then you do like um and you do a huge pull out to reveal the the, the 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 ten million monsters coming crawling over the mountain and 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 down towards you in the valley, you know. But you do that huge uh, pull out and you reveal that you've got twenty people standing really tightly together in a huge expansive valley and they're all standing so tight that they're in each other's personal space basically you know and they're getting ready to to you know take on an army you know that stating screams it's a small studio you know you know that you know almost exactly where the extension starts and 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 where the studio floor ends you know um that that's another one you know but the for the by far the the biggest one is just uh, you don't like don't use v if you if there's like don't don't just put it in there as a thrill you know if you put it in there as a thrill it will lose its its uh thrillingness you know just use it when when basically there's nothing else that will do the job you know you don't use costume to fix um the lighting you know you, uh, i mean yeah you could hang a hang a dress over over a light and dim it that way but that wouldn't be a good way to fi- fix the lighting you know so don't use the effects to fix the story or the direction or, or any of the other stuff you know i, I for me i think uh, our most holy kind of purpose is to be a department just like all the other departments. That is to say, when you need an explosion, you call in the SFX guys and they bring their big diesel explosion monster and they they make a huge fireball, you know. But the rest of you're not just putting in the diesel explosion machine here and there just to put it in or, or making more shots than necessary. And also... <clears throat> Once you do that, once you approach it like that, you also start thinking then when you're doing VFX shots, okay, if it wasn't a VFX shot, if if I was doing this for real, what how would you know, how would we shoot it? You know, we would probably this is a huge valley. We wouldn't be able to we wouldn't be in a helicopter because the rest of the show doesn't have any helicopter shots, so let's not have one here, right? So um so we would be on a tripod on the opposite mountain, just shooting the valley pretty pretty undramatically, but the scenery itself is dramatic, you know, and you can see your matte painting of, of the forgotten city or whatever. And that that's how we would shoot it. So now you start making making your your photographic filmic language conform with with all of the, the real uh, shots that are non VFX, you know, this is what you see a lot. I think, I think like you'll see, you know, a, you'll see an, a, something that's supposed to be a huge action film and a VFX film and everything, but you'll see a very uh, traditional build uh, sequence right up till where the VFX really kick off, and then after that, then you know, the, all all the rules go out the window here now you've got your most uh, epic and and uh, expensive camera move you've got your you've all of a sudden you go from having sparsely populated frames with 10 extras and stuff like that to having thousands and 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 so on so so you know as soon as we go into the cd um, sandbox people a lot of 
producers, directors uh, pile it on way too thick and without thinking about each sex aspect as you would do with the normal filming. And uh, t- uh, shamefully, I would say, too many uh, uh, supervisors are, are happy to let them do that or don't know any better themselves or whatever, you know, whatever. I'm not going to question anybody's motivation. I, I, do, I do think that once you do these kind of movies and shots all the time, you kind of just think that this is what we do, you know, here comes the fight. So now we're doing that thing that we do when we do the fight. So, um, <clears throat> but that's something I think we really need to get out of and get out of as quickly, you know, like for me, the most thrilling VFX film of the last many years, maybe even a decade for me is Dune by far, you know, that was the film that really, really made me happy about our industry again, you know, and that they use the VFX so sparsely and so correctly, and and they they use only only where it's the best tool of them all, you know, only where it's the best way to carry the arc forward and so on, you know. So so um, and they also did, for example, and this is why I love Paul Lambert so much. He's a compositor himself. He's actually the inventor of a. Uh, IBK, um, the uh, the IBK key here in Newark. Yeah, 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 so he invented that uh, back in the day in, when he was at the digital uh, domain and Nuke was the uh, proprietary software they had. Um, and, but it's for him, it's the photographic, like he, he seems to nail the photographic um, uh, par- uh, parameters uh, before anything that's for him the most important thing is to get the exposure right vfx is more often than not guys i'm sorry to say the exposure is wrong you know because we want to show our work you know but it's often in scenes where you shouldn't be able to see anything other than just the glint in the eyes of the monster or whatever and so we have a tendency to over light our stuff and over expose our I was overexposed in terms of now I don't mean exposure as light, but like over present, you know, have it too too uh, too uh, commonly um, uh, available. So so be sparse, you know, save it for for the big thrill, you know. That's that's my advice, at least, you know. So. I mean, if you ever see the alien suit um, not lit in the movie, but if you ever see the backstage, it, yeah. it's really fake. I mean, it's a yeah rubber suit yeah yeah but in the movie it looks real and yeah because they've done exactly what you've said they've lit it sparsely you hardly see it i mean it's amazing if you watch alien how little you see that scene. exactly and that's exactly that's what i love that's why that's like for me you know it's not filmmaking unless you have all these kind of uh uh, limits you know once when you have that then it becomes film making then it's like the suit's not good enough guys what what the fuck can we what excuse my friends what can we do here you know and everybody's pissed and we have a big meeting about and stuff and and then you know the gaffer comes over and we'll have it super super low light and we'll we'll um we'll just smoke smoke it up you know like, like a lot of smoke and we with like a really thick Atmo and stuff like that. And I'll do that. And it's, that's beautiful. It's, it works, you know, and, and, um, and also the, the other benefit of that is like, nobody's in doubt because we're watching it on the monitor. You know, we see if it works or not, you know, and if it doesn't work, we'll do it again. Okay. More smoke, less smoke, you know, whatever. Whereas once it's down the post line, it, it becomes isolated and too few people are involved in the conversation really, you know, it, it's now maybe only the director and, and the uh, visual effects produ- uh, supervisor or, or the producer or at the most the producer and the DP, you know, but there's no gaffer, there's no costume, there's no makeup, there's no, you know, all of these really important departments that do so much for, for film in general, you know, yeah, I wonder mm-hmm. if we can we can dive in into into virtual production, considering what we've just been talking about. 
Um, also because the last time we spoke, it wasn't the thing of the, the trend, I guess, in VFX. So I'm just wondering what your thoughts are uh, on, on virtual production and maybe how, how if any, uh, has it It's already, I mean, a well. long sense. time ago, actually, yeah, uh, without me even knowing it at the time. So I did some scans for Mandalorian uh, season two. So, and I didn't actually know that that was going to go into the volume, but it, it uh, ended up there. Um, and um, so, so it's definitely affecting a lot. And like exactly this um, production I got off, uh, um, if there's going to be a season two, for example, my, my recommendation is that we now do quite a bit of virtual production on, uh, uh, alongside shooting on location. Uh, the way where we shot in in Saudi Arabia is called Tabuk, um, and there's a there's a media uh, kind of a studio complex called Neom, um, and that studio complex has two studios, and and then you just have the desert, like it is in the desert, and you just then drive into the desert and find various locations if you want to go location, but. Uh, for interior stuff and uh, and um, so on, you can work in the studio, which is nice. Um, and I suggested that they would have uh, they would get some um, some LED studio to to be able to assemble it in one of the studios. Um, but and it, like it's been a huge uh, game changer. I think uh, I think it 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 makes even more work for for uh, visual effects supervisors. Uh, you need to be even more careful with your planning because if you're shooting plates, then you know you need to calculate your, your depth of field and you need to understand what, uh, you know, that, you know, I mean, most cases you'll have to settle for a nodal camera move uh, rather than a free camera when you're dealing with plates. Uh, uh, of, of course, if it's very far away, then it's fine, maybe. But and the, these, this is what I'm now seeing. Not that I watch much, but I at least watch trailers and I see what my kids are watching and stuff like that. I'm seeing a lot of mistakes being made with the LED screens uh, now, you know, because it's such a hype thing, and everybody, oh, it's there's no green screen, and we don't have to all that problem and so on, you know, but. Instead of the green screen, now you're exactly seeing the parallax issues, the focus issues, mm -hmm. and more often than not, you're seeing wrong black levels. I don't know if you've noticed, Daniel, as a compositor, but you'll see way mm -hmm. too lifted black labels levels on the uh, on the screens, you know, on the backgrounds, and that's usually. I mean, it, it's a hard problem to deal with in general, but if you don't have a fully contained LED studio where you can kill all the ambient lighting and only have the, your material driving the lighting, then you'll always have that light bleed uh, uh, onto the wall, you know, we're lifting the blacks. And, and then you'll always have a have the uh, higher black blacks than uh, on the wall than on, on your foreground subject. So these these are the kind of problems that that now are pretty clear to me at least. I'm sure there's more, some that I haven't noticed, but these are, are, are mm -hmm. things that I'm seeing all the time. Uh, but you know, we also know this, and you know this, guys working hard hours in the post. You know that the effects is not always about the best quality. You know, sometimes the producer makes the call to have a lot lower quality. And save himself, uh, you know, a lot of money on it, you know, and and he's happy with it because he knows it won't it won't bother his audience, you know. Um, so I also feel like many of the streamers are maybe it's certainly not the old studio level uh, um, kind of quality control uh, situation that that they're going through often. Uh, and then. Plenty of productions are the best quality you'll ever see. You know, I'm not saying it's one or the other. I'm just saying it seems to be an option to kind of maybe go to to slack, slack uh, you know, to to let 
a little bit of a you know lifted black level slide or or you know a little bit of you know it's only it's only nerd, nerds like us that will notice that you know now this year but i mean they lift them in grade they lift them in grade yeah. as well so sometimes you can say maybe maybe the composite or maybe even yeah. the plate was perfect yeah it's yeah like, well that that part of it i absolutely drives me nuts you know and i i it, it it is a miracle that I have not uh, murdered any colorists uh, yet, you know, because the grading the grading part of of, of our industry uh, can be an amazing, powerful tool. But if if the gaffer and the DP is doing that job correctly, more often than not, the most beautiful image is just to maybe give it a little bit of a contrast thing and just leave the thing alone, you know, because they've done an amazing job, job you know. And and what I, uh, drives me absolutely nuts is when they exactly kind of, uh, you know, make separation between layers that, that we have spent, you know, hours and hours to just blend seamlessly together and so on, you know, and I, I myself had one one issue where where I was doing one of these horrible car comps and I actually didn't get to supervise it, but I, I was comping it, so I was it was a it was a struggling uh, uh, thing to do because it was shot wrongly. It was overexposed in the in the uh, interior of the car and or uh, overlit, and um, and it actually turned out pretty well until it went to grade where they took a set, made some secondary keys that had horrible banding all over in the keys and, and graded it to like once again introduced layers where there shouldn't be any and, and so on, you know. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, but I mean, the, the, this is also once again, this is maybe the same kind of conversation as with the CT and stuff like that. I feel like in terms of bad use of VFX, it's it's usually when we get into full CG or close to full CG that the the wheels come off very often. Um, and in terms of grading, like when people want to go stylized and grading for long form projects, uh, they lose me pretty quickly. And there's, you know, I think there's maybe a handful at most. Uh, artists that that where I where I would concede that they actually might bring something to to the footage, you know. But the rest of the time, it's to the de detriment of the footage. I think, yeah. unfortunately, we'll try and get a colorist. Don't we, I have been trying to get a okay, very good colorist. Okay, to answer some of these accusations yeah. on the podcast. But I I I have seen also. And I will not name or shame, but I, yeah, we've all had that experience. I think mean, every composer has had that experience of doing something they were very proud of and then seeing the grade. Mm. I mean, on the other hand, I've seen things where I thought there's no way this is ever going to work. And I've seen. Publicity. Yeah. Do miracles. Yeah. They, I, I'll give them that for sure. Exactly. Yeah. 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 But that, that's kind of the same. That sour version of the alien suit is not going to stand up for a full body shot. So let's just. Let's just have a hint of it here and a hint of it there, you know. And that, yeah, good colorists can do stuff like that for sure, yeah. And they, this is exactly um, what they what they should. And they can do a lot of tricks. They can help exposure, no, uh, focus and exposure and all kinds of stuff, you know. So, so when they're doing that kind of work, I, I appreciate that. But the the kind of the heavy stylized touch is rarely something I'm happy with. Uh, as I say that I would be fun if you guys would get the Dune colorist now to completely put me in my place, you know, and say like it was the heaviest graded movie of all time or something, you know. Which I, it's it's, say it's quite yeah strong. yeah it's kind of it's kind of it's strong very blue yeah. cold yeah planet and there's a very uh, warm, I do right yeah i do think though in general it's kind of going with what's in the plate kind of pushing it uh like maybe like expanding it a little bit and and so on and i've seen some of the um raw footage of it so uh, i i'm i feel pretty okay still you know but that, that would definitely be one that i would love to see would if you could if you could get a hold of of the or, or somebody on the colorist team. Yeah, yeah, exactly. 
that would be great if you're yeah. watching come on the show <laughs> yeah send, send maybe send, send the paul paul lambert a message and uh he's he's a fellow londoner like yeah. you guys i think so he could yeah. give you a name i'm sure uh, all right yeah so um yeah we had um we asked some of our listeners um okay if they had any questions for you and yeah we had a few come in so um yeah so yeah Kab, uh, Kabir Ahmed was was asking um what the latest tech Oof, is well I, I'm not the right guy to 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 ask that I mean what what I I would actually say one thing guys the one thing that uh, sounds like so banal and and silly but uh, there's an app for the iPhone called Scaniverse that I, I don't know if you know that, but that app has actually been a real lifesaver for all kinds of fluid situations where you don't have the time to set it up in a real, you know, photogrammetry tent or, or anything, you know, you just need to get some kind of data, uh, some kind of scanned data uh, really quickly. Um, and and that app has really produced some great re results, you know, and... and um, uh, I'm I'm not like saying it's ever gonna be like a, a staple of, of uh, a big production environment or anything like that. But having that in your po pocket as a Swiss Army knife is amazing, actually. So uh, um, I would say my favorite piece of tech right now is just my Canon R5, my my camera. It's uh, the amount of stuff I can do with that, like uh, the the quality of the photogrammetry which I'm scanning on it is amazing. The quality of the 8K raw plates that I'm shooting on it, you know, it's amazing. You know, it's just uh, once again having a little little tool like that in your back and and being able to quickly, you know, you know, you see you, you, the element shoots not happening now because you're working double shifts and whatever, you know. Can I borrow one of your SFX guys, maybe, and we can go in the corner here? And, and now you've got some elements where you where they had been scrapped, you know, or or you see crowds being directed, you know, and they, it's two cameras. You take another angle, then you have the third angle on the on the crowd, you know, and stuff like that, you know. So. Um, I'm constantly kind of using it as uh, a tool for targets of opportunity, you know, and, and I love it. It's just an amazing camera. If you're into photography in general, it's an absolutely amazing camera. So Yeah. And um, yeah, Zlato was asking about dangerous situations on set. There's a lot, you know, it's actually, you know, the, the, the thing about being on set is like we're so... We're so focused and a lot of us are really stressed and, and pressed, you know, and, and you could almost say scared, you know, and you very often see very people that are that stressed that they're just in a uh, kind of in a, not in a state of panic, they're still fun functioning, but they're, they're, they're completely scared, you know, and when they do that, they completely forget to have any regard for their own safety, you know, and you often see people go way too close to, you know, at cliff edges and, and way too close to dangerous machinery and, you know, step over the, the lines for stunts, you know, when they're doing their line pulls and stuff like that. Some of those lines are, are really, they're like put onto, um, you know, kind of a catapult equipment and stuff like that, you know, so... If you get that line stretched onto you, it can be really dangerous. And and um, uh, yeah, there, there's plenty of danger on by uh, like unless it's just a studio environment and you're doing you know the latest Miss Marple or something like that. Then then there's usually plenty of danger to to be found, and you really need to be careful and keep your senses about you. Um, in Saudi Arabia, there was a lot of heat strokes, for example. Yeah, that's that was just one of those basic dangers that that everybody <coughs> excuse me that that everybody has to think about when you're in the desert, you know. And and we had daily people uh, collapsing with heat strokes, you know. So 
so keeping hydrated and and and, and keeping you know, keeping covered from the sun and stuff like that yeah. got two more questions um one is from yin wu he asked whether you prefer the clockwork rhythm of positing at a studio or the more chaotic <laughs> workflow of being on i love the chaos <laughs> i have to say i absolutely love the chaos mm-hmm. um I would say, and I'm kind of unique. I actually kind of, I wouldn't say uh, the chaos maybe, but like, yeah, having a, a, the the more, like I would, I would be more probably stressed nowadays if it was, let's say some kind of huge CG scene and everything was previous and everything was, you know, completely perfect. And it was a controlled studio environment and, there was no winging it anywhere. Then I would probably get more self self aware, you know, because you, that's it's been a while since I've done anything, and I haven't done I haven't done the biggest scale in that term, you know. But I I have done a lot of chaotic stuff, you know, and and that's turned out okay. So I kind of feel home there, and, and but I am comping now. I am comping an Icelandic movie like eight hours a day or. 10, 10, 12, and it's going to be 16 hours probably next week. Um, uh, and that's nice, though, just to, like, I am kind of getting back into, you know, having a good cup of, cup of coffee and listening to a good po- podcast and just, you know, getting into the the sen of, you know, getting those pixels to look just right, you know, it, that's nice as well. But I don't, I mean, I'm a supervisor, so... I can really only do it with these Icelandic movies. The way, the reason I'm still comping and and like really hands-on comping on on Icelandic movies is because once again I have these relationships with with producers and and directors up here, and often it comes down to we, we don't have the money, and I'll then go and say, uh, well, you know, you you twenty percent short, but if you can stretch out your 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 production your post production so i can use more of my idle time to work on it then i personally can comp a lot more and i won't be taking any risk on 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 uh, salary for for freelancers and stuff like that and then i'm willing to to you know take more of a chance with the price and i'll lower the price for you that way you know and you know, 99% of the time the producer says, yes, I'll take that deal for sure. I'll, you'll get more time if you can do it. So that's a way I've found I can I can do it. I can keep myself, you know, involved in the comp, which uh, I would be really sad if I kind of completely lost touch with that. You know, of course, you never completely lose touch. But if I completely lost my touch, you know, if I was now... You know, so many versions behind everybody else, and and then you know, fumbling about with the newest gear and stuff like that. Then, then it becomes non-viable to do it. You know, and I think I'm still viable to do it, even though I'm sure most most senior compers are, are by far uh, better than me by now. But I'm still a critical supervisor, so I still have to uh, I have to uh, get my own approval, which is not always easy so <laughs> yeah yeah my last question from Wu as well is just asking how you feel about the downtimes with waiting around for for the right take yeah i mean it's it's a it's a definitely a true cliche that you know in movies it's hurry up and wait you know that's definitely especially when you're in these specialized departments but in visual effects you know there's Usually, we can usually be, do something to use the time. But as a supervisor, I I, I shouldn't be straying off too much. You know, I want to keep, because there's always stuff coming up. So I want to stay close to the directors, close to the monitor, just keep an eye on it and just hang around. And then I, that when, if there's actual downtown, this is when I get to know people, you know, because people are super interesting on, on, on set, you know, and I just cultivate that, you know, get, real friends for life really and um and i also i'm very always very curious about the other departments so i'll I'll have a long conversation about something that doesn't have any impact on me maybe but i just find it interesting you know and just learn about about that stuff you know um but usually i mean 
unless like downtown would usually uh, be when the when there's a lot of work going on or very high tempo but it doesn't at all involve vfx so that means that i don't have a producer i don't have a director to talk between takes and stuff like that because usually i'm close to the monitor if not just next to the director and um and between takes, usually the conversation always goes into something, you know, that we were thinking about the next day or the next scene or whatever and trying to stay on top of that, you know. So as a supervisor, there's not too much downtime, but I, I like it when I do get it, you know. I, I think it's more like, yeah, some of the other departments, you can definitely see how, how it can get tedious, you know. Um, you know, for example, uh, you know, lighting often gets, you know, it's crazy, crazy busy and hard and heavy work, you know, for a couple of minutes because everybody's waiting for the lighting to be ready. And then when it's ready, then maybe we shoot the whole day with that lighting. And it's just like maybe tweak one lamp here and one lamp there once an hour at the most, you know, and you have a whole department for that. And that now they're just standing around, you know. And I can see how they get bored, but you know you shouldn't really get bored and set. There's plenty to learn and understand, and uh, amazing people to get to know. So. What would you? What would be your advice to a filmmaker who is looking at using VFX for mm -hmm. the first time? I, I get this a lot these days. Actually, I would. I mean, there there is definitely benefit to it, but. For most filmmakers, they will probably get themselves in more trouble than not, you know, because if they are too cognitive of, of, of what, because our department is quite special. It's really all of the other departments put into one virtual post department. You, you have lighting, you have modeling, you have, you have all of the others. You have even costumes and stuff like that, you know, so... So our department is 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 way too overwhelming for 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 example a director I think unless it's just his natural interest and and he, he finds it easy to learn this stuff that's fine but I would say you know it, you you would be wary of a director that would let lighting have have a huge influence on on his his story arc before he goes to do it you know even though lighting will be a key stylistic element in his production and all of that you know you would just basically tell him don't worry we'll do the lighting that's fine just make sure you do your arc and do it you know write whatever you want the story to be and then we'll figure out how we do it, if we can do it, and and uh, how we do it, you know. So uh, and that's similar to what I've I've uh, recommended for for because they ask me a lot, directors actually, how how to. Uh, so I've recommended mostly that they don't worry about that and and just maybe you know if anything you know try and work with many supervisors and try and. Um, you know, try and try and learn learn about the supervisors. You know, what what is this guy giving me? What is this guy giving me, and so on. You know, because that that you might actually get some uh, something as a director. You know, you say, oh, I want to do uh, animated short. You know, and this guy is an unbelievable CG slash animation supervisor. So I. I want to use him, you know. So uh, that's what, for example, ha happened with the um, prehistoric planet. You know, there's directors that come out of animation, you know, because it's dinosaurs. It's really important understanding and, and the anatomy and and the performance of these animals. You know, they it's it's very very um, crucial to this to the success of the arc of of that series. Is is that we get a connection with the dinosaurs and, and it's believable and all of that, you know, so, uh, so, but if you insist on, on learning about visual effects, I would, I would almost say, you know, have fun then and, and go into the old stuff, you know, and, and learn about what they do, how, how it really started. And I mean, you can say it started in 
well, you can even say Charlie Chaplin and stuff like that. But I think the industry as we have it right now, for me, it started with uh, Stanley Kubrick's 2001. You know, it started with uh, the amazing Douglas Trumbull, who uh, is passed away now, um, who really introduced our our new me- uh, modern methods of working. Uh, th- then it was a, a photographic, completely photographic, chemical mechanical uh painterly process but all of those principles are still really the our main categories and main um uh, as, at least from the the assembly part the compositing part is is still our main um uh, tools and i i would say if you if you then understand these principles really well you know whether you come at it from modern production or the old fashioned I, for me i find it more fun to what's what the old guys did you know and um, then then i think yeah then you are definitely uh, in a good place you you you've added something to your to your uh, palette for sure um, but you know like me i have a couple of stories i i want to do and uh, in some ways i see it as a impairment having the the hands on experience you know because it it builds in problems so like my my reaction is so naturally to try and solve the problem that i'm not letting the story live you know so um you really have to be careful with that you know because when you're ma- making stories you shouldn't worry about any problems you know sky should be the limit and then we start breaking it down and and work out how actually we can do it there in terms of if you want me to be specific, I would actually recommend the ILM uh, docu series on uh, Disney Plus. Now it's it's very kind of a, a casual, a really good casual introduction to what visual effects is. You know, even though it's mainly dealing with with uh, how ILM was before it became. Uh, computerized but they even go pretty pretty well in depth with that before i let you go i just wanted to to get your your opinion as we were we were discussing earlier on about the the recent outcry for um overwork or overworking of, of artists um i mean i i guess yeah. you've, you've 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 had that from early because i, I know being on set is <laughs> pretty much you guys have it to, to the extreme so i'm just wondering well, actually, yeah. no, I would, I mean, you're right there, Kofi, in some certain situation, but that's so condensed in period. You know, the thing about the onset is it's all unionized. And even when it's not unionized, there's enough of union rules in there that it matters. So once you go beyond 10 hours, it's overtime. So you get one and a half time. And once you go beyond 12 hours, you get double pay or whatever. So all of these things are kind of settled in in the uh, onset world, you know. And this, of course, doesn't apply to a visual effects supervisor who's working on a bit, you know. He's just there as a contractor, and com- like I'm not directly on salary with the, on with the production as the main crew is. But so it doesn't apply really to me. But but in terms of the working environment, that all is settled. It's not settled in our industry, of course. And I would definitely say the the, the long, 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 long periods where you can be working uh, 12, 14, 16 hour days, six, six day weeks for three months or something to get some crazy deadline over the line. Uh, that's really, really wearing and, and creates way too much burnout you know but the problem visual facts has kind of built into it is that as even as as clever as we are with all the computers and stuff like that as you guys know it's very manual labor heavy heavy really you know you there's a lot of manual work that needs to go into it you know and and when that is the the, the pressure to keep pay and and uh, conditions uh, low is enormous you know it's it's not only our industry even though our industry is not very nice in that regard but it, you know when you have these these kind of um, tasks that needs just a lot of manpower 
it's very rare that they become high paying uh, high paying uh, uh, jobs in our industries our industry at least has this tier system so you know you work your way up through the rank and become senior now you're making a decent living and and your conditions hopefully is a little bit better you know but you really have to go through some brutal stuff as a junior getting into into the movies and stuff like that you know and and i really don't think there's like i can understand it. i can understand it in terms of i can explain it but we shouldn't be fine with it the companies shouldn't be fine with it vfx companies are working on a way to to narrow margins in gen, general you know there's very little and can go go array before the company is in in real big trouble you know so um um this is um you know the, the the problem with with vfx is of course it's so easily outsourceable and so easily movable in terms of work that um that we will always be f- fighting a lower bit somewhere you know so um but but i would say just in general guys for f- you know in with film in general it it if you go into thinking i'm going to get a job here you're probably not going to be very happy you really need to approach it in in a way that way you're thinking this is going to be my lifestyle because i am an artist anyway i really i really uh, aspire to, to do these what i consider is the highest in in artistry uh, in our day and age and and I want to get into that. So now you approach it as a lifestyle. Now the fact that you're doing something to make the picture better, but you're not really getting paid for it or whatever, that doesn't bite as much. You know, you're not as pissed as as before. You know, and 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 I'm and like then you the answer to that would be well, don't won't people take advantage of you or whatever? I'm sure they will. Uh, the 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 bad actors will. You know, but that's the people that you're gonna be running from what as soon as you 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 have the experience as soon as you're senior you're gonna move yourself away from those people and into better people and so on and i would in general say when you're junior just don't worry like if you have a situation where you can not worry too much about the low pay go into the bigger companies and get that um, experience working in the big pipelines with the with the high-end movies and learning from some of the best seniors in the world and um and learn that and then you know when you want to try and build something a little bit more stable for yourself and you're thinking maybe a little bit more about life quality along with the artistry and all of that then maybe go into slightly smaller studios, the medium-sized studios and stuff like that. The, I found that they have more, more uh, of a culture and maybe more room to accommodate people as people, you know. But because s- some situations it's almost cattle-like, you know. It really is sweatshops, you know, in in some periods uh, in some companies, you know. And and I don't like I I don't. I, I, you know, I know some companies are doing it uh, in a, a slight, not malicious way, but in a cynical way, maybe. Um, but I think actually most companies are just struggling planning this, and and you know, and they just get they get a uh, you know exposed to sell themselves. You know, they get in trouble financially themselves. You know, so um, <clears throat> so I I don't I don't think. Um, Blaming is maybe the right approach. I think I do think the industry in general is going more towards smaller size studios than than the big big whales, you know. And I think uh, they are still out there, but I think their their conditions is harder and harder for them to to exist. To be honest, and and we're getting you know better and better and do it doing really high end stuff in with fewer and fewer people, you know. So. So it means that the, those people that are doing it in the smaller studios are getting more meaningful work, not just the road or not just the paint. You know, they're being brought up the line quicker than than in in the old days in the big studios. You know, so uh, yeah. Yes. Uh, 
It's not. It's really. It's it's one of those uh, which is really almost impossible to solve at this current moment. Technologies and stuff like that will influence. You know, we see AI potentially down the line taking care of things like road or maybe and 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 stuff like that. You know, uh, but you know, also we should also you know this might be brutal, badly paid work. You know, but it's maybe making a foundation for people in India and China or Bangladesh or whatever, which, you know, maybe maybe that's not a bad thing, even though we can maybe see the malicious or the cynical producer, you know, in Hollywood, you know, saving another uh, another hundred million, you know, and pocketing it. And if you approach things that way, you'll always struggle with uh, enjoying your yourself, I think, uh, because you can always find cynical elements in this business and and but the truth is the, the business is mainly uh populated by really amazing kind and and generous people you know so uh try and try and enjoy that rather than let the the few bad apples spoil Having it said right? that, just well as you mentioned most of the film industry is mm-hmm. unionized do you think that's something that will mm-hmm. develop within vfx do you think there's something that should develop within vfx yeah i think i think so i don't i i mean there's there there are parallels but then there's things that so you know like the fact that the the work is so easily movable you know so one territory will unionize and you know the hollywood i mean to be honest these streamers have more of a it's part of their marketing even is to be more aware of the environment not to be basically bad bad companies you know and so i think maybe it should be more of a dialogue with the with the with the uh, producers you know uh, how to get us in there because if if it's going to be really successful i think if we started a real dialogue if we if we had some kind of organization where we started a real dialogue with the producing parties about how to get us in there, just like how to get us on a credit list, you know, where we should be on the credit list and so on. If we start that dialogue with them, then at some point, it, first of all, it will become clear who's completely cynical and, and working this system maliciously. Uh, and it, it, it will also become clear who is who will be the main driver of change on their side um, so and 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 once something is settled even if it's way too little for us once something is settled we then know that that's actually going to become a standard and that will then maybe be some kind of base that we can then start working working upwards from you know um i i, I don't think um i mean there's a lot of problems with with you with unions as well you know even even the union guys will tell you you know it it can you know the the the, the famous thing is like somebody will drop a coffee copy cuff and uh, on set and they won't you know uh, they won't clean it up after them because they're not they're, that's not they're not allowed to by union rules and so on there's supposed to be a cleaner that cleans that coffee cup and so on you know um, so it can be a little bit too um, too rule heavy as well, but in general, I feel like it works pretty well. And I think um, something similar definitely is, you know, that it should be the starting point from from when when uh, what we should talk about in in our di- industry. I definitely think so. Yeah, I mean, I don't think I don't think anybody will will. Um, gain in the long term by this high rate of burnout that we see in our industry. I mean, there's there's, uh, the the other thing is that you get these talented people that just stop doing the effects. And it's it's sad, you know, people want to do it. Excuse me, guys, my son, my son is like, the boy after 20 minutes. No, I we excuse me, guys. I think we've we've covered all the bases. I think we want to put some kind of some kind of summary what would you what would be your way of kind of concluding this interview if you could say one thing as a i mean 
good advice once again you know you know take it as as a, you know approach it as a lifestyle as because you are an artist so this is a way for you to to live you know through your work your artistic life um work hard uh, be honest don't worry about getting yours if you're working hard and honest people will notice and they will they will definitely uh, want to promote you uh, and and will promote themselves on the way you know because you're you're an asset um and um embrace the filmmaker i would say you know if you're in visual effects and doing primarily long form and and film you know really embrace that and and um and have fun with that uh, you you will your your if visual effects will will uh, flourish for it i think thank you so yeah thank you so much thank you all thank right you for, for your time <laughs>